I guess we should restrict this to, at the most, uh, 10 minutes, because we started pretty late, but we don't want to compound the problem. Uh, questions from the floor? Yeah. Give the mic here. Antonio Foglia, private banker and investor. We, um, you have described basically uh, a set of uh, network basically based on the hub and spoke, which seems to come out in nature uh, pretty often and is seen also in some banking markets, for instance, the unregulated OTC markets or the interbank markets. And if I look at the history of regulating markets, I have the impression that the whole story of regulated market is about breaking that model and moving it more towards egalitarian networks, more similar to tennis network, where the failure of individual nodes does not impact the overall functionality of the system, which is the risk that we are running with the current OTC market, where the hub and spoke structure makes them very vulnerable. Question. <laughs> what would you think about analyzing market structures and regulated market under this sort of framework? Anyone that wants to particularly uh, come back on this? Sanjeev? After presses. Um, yeah, just a very quick uh, response. So, um, so I think there are two ways of doing this, uh, responding to what you're saying. One is to ask, um, you know, if these um, hub banks were allowed to do things in their own interest, uh, would they actually choose a level of security that would uh, somehow, you know, take care of the problem? Now the Existing work, which is mostly based on simulations of large uh, interbank networks, seems to actually suggest that uh, these core periphery networks are actually quite robust. Um, so, so that's one observation. Uh, so, so that's actually quite a surprise, and we don't. We have some theories. Um, the other question one might ask is, supposing you have this environment as it is, and you were allowed to design the network in an optimal way, how would you design the network? How would you, would you make it hub spoke? Would you make it homogenous, flat? And the answer there seems to be, well, it depends on uh, what resources you have. So supposing you have very limited resources to protect the network. Um, and then actually there are theorems. Uh, um, you know, we've just been working on some of these things which show that if your resources are limited, the best thing you can do is actually to have a small core and assign all your resources to protecting the core. If you had a flatter network, you would really need to disperse your defense or you know, your resources, and you just don't have enough resources to go around. So it may actually be socially optimal to have such a network under some you know, certain environments. Thank you. Mr. Soros? Uh, two brief questions. One, is, is there any noticeable difference between in the behavior or structure of human networks and inanimate networks uh, like telephone or electricity? And secondly, uh, nobody mentioned uh, increasing returns, yet it seems to me that uh, the bigger the network, uh, the greater its value, and certainly that was an influence perhaps in the IT bubble. Um, Frank, do you want to answer that? <laughs> yes, uh, so, so in, increasing returns are certainly what drives the resource pooling in, in networks. It's statistically, the, the statistical multiplexing becomes more efficient. Um, and uh, that, that drives the desire to, to be able to share resources to make the system as a whole behave organically. Um, the problem is that you don't feel pain in part of the network because it's, the load is shed to somewhere else until you feel pain across the entire network. So the challenge, at least in the technological networks, is to find ways whereby the information that is accessible at the network level, which is very primitive information available at the network level, the way that can be used to detect the, the systemic uh, uh, externality of the behavior of the local nodes. The local nodes don't see that information. They see much more local information. So, so my own feeling is that the traditional economic description of this, that you're trying to price the, ex the, the, the network externality so that the individual banks or the individual agents can see the network effect of what they do. The difficulty is that um, the time lags, 
the localization of information and the stochastic stability of the system becomes overwhelming. And that, that's, that's the challenge to work out how to get uh, averaged longer term measures at the network level that can influence the, the, the regulatory behavior at the, at, the, at the shorter level. I saw a wonderful phrase from um, uh, Sanjit, uh, Sujit uh, Kapadia, uh, uh, microprudential rules that produce macro produce prudential stability. Your question about inanimate uh, networks, I'm not sure that uh, we can see a big difference. If one looks at some of the inanimate networks that we're looking at, say for example, um, sale of AdWords on Google or, or, or Microsoft's networks, um, then the most interesting behavior is produced not by human beings up in their bids or not, but by algorithms that are used by human beings to up their bids and not. Um, the time scales on which these things happen are so fast that it has to be done by a computer. Um, and yet, at the same time, the, the incentives are those on the human actors, on the commercial players who are trying to advertise their pizza parlor or whatever. So, so the algorithm is attempting to implement at high speed what is the incentive for the, for the, uh, for, for the advertiser. So I'm not, I'm, I don't see a particular natural distinction between inanimate and animate. I mean, I see, I see levels of intelligence increasing, and those levels of intelligence causing changes. But it's, it's not the animate-inanimate distinction. Um, there's quite a few hands. Let's take the two up at this table here. Hello there. Uh, Richard Bronk, London School of Economics. I mean, to pick up on the last question, it seems to me that one of the things in an interpreted world that's different um, is that uh, it's, it's one of the things that's different between a, a human world and, and, a, and a physical world is it is an interpreted world. And what happens if the physical and epistemic networks are different? And should we be modeling this? I mean, take, for example, networks in banking. One of the things was you had the, the, the network effects between the banks, but you also had the epistemic network effects. And if, at an extreme case, if all the models share the same risk model, then the network will behave very differently than if all the banks share, uh, have different risk models. So should you be modeling the overlay of epistemic networks against the overlay of physical networks? That's my question. Uh, Greg Fisher. Um, three excellent talks, but a question more for Doyne, I think. Um, there was a quite a famous meeting at Santa Fe between uh, some eminent economists and some eminent natural scientists, I think in 1989 or something. Um, there's been some good work done in complexity economics, uh, Brian Arthur, for instance. Um, but that meeting didn't seem to have a great significant impact on the economics community as a whole. Um, why not? Yeah, so I was at that meeting. The meeting happened in 1986. And there were people like Ken Arrow was there. Larry Summers was there. Um, a variety of other economists, about half economists, half physicists. And it was a two-week slugfest. And actually, I somewhat disagree that it didn't have any impact. I just don't think they wanted to credit us with the impact. Um, the physicists immediately said, what the hell are you guys talking about? People are not rational. This is obvious. That shouldn't, you know, and people like Larry Summers subsequently wrote models making that point. Um, so I think we presaged, the criticism presaged the move towards behavioral economics. Um, it also actually led to some, some synthetic interactions between physicists and economics, like um, the Santa Fe stock market paper with Brian Arthur and John Holland and Blake LeBaron and Richard Palmer, that um, really have led the way in the kind of alternative economics community towards showing things like power laws are generated by the market itself. They're not coming from outside. And, and giving an idea about the kind of phenomena that happened as you drive markets outside of equilibrium. So I, I, think, I think that, mo that um, that meeting certainly had a lot of impact in alternative economics communities, and I think it had impact even in the mainstream communities. It wasn't fully acknowledged. Tom Sargent's another person that subsequently wrote about the effects of learning, which was another thing all the physicists immediately said, wait, you've re really got to put learning in there. Um, so, and I don't know if I can really answer the other question about, could, let me see if I understood. You were saying what's the difference between the physical network, or how does the physical network relate to the epi episystemic effects? What, what, what is your question? 
No, no it's really that um, if, if, if there are certain network effects in terms of the epistemology of the actors themselves, so if, ah. if so certain networks of banks share the same risk model, or yeah, in, yeah. in some cases all the banks yeah. in the particular market share the same risk model or none of them share the same risk model, if they're looking at the world through different models yeah, or the okay. same model, then those epistemic network effects have an, effect, have an implication for the behavior of the whole physical network as yeah. well. So it seems like the key thing you're talking about is heterogeneity. Exactly. And what's the role of heterogeneity? And I think this is a hugely underestimated and uh, effect that needs to be exploited much better. Um, you know, a lot of the things we're seeing, for example, some of these power laws, we can show that it's heterogeneity that's driving them. And, and because we can actually break the system down, and when you break it down into its components, none of the components show it on their own. They only show it when you aggregate them all together. And this seems to be the case for firms and for um, uh, uh, fluctuations in trading volume and financial markets and several other things. I think understanding how heterogeneity really percolates through economic theory is a major task that has really not been done because it makes the models harder. People use representative agent models because they're easier and more tractable. But I think in a lot of cases you get conclusions that are just qualitatively wrong from doing that. And, Sanjeev, and did I you want to come in on this? Sorry, we, we need to sure. speed up the responses. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to compliment what Don was saying. Um, so, so essentially, um, there the are two sort of, if you like, polar ways of looking at these problems. One is to say that there are people having, you know, let's say risk models in their minds and they're making portfolio choices and uh, let's put them in a the market and see what happens. Uh, the other way to think about it is um, they're all actually, we, we abstract, maybe we think they're all the same, and we put them in a network. So the only heterogeneity is the network heterogeneity. What you're, I think, drawing attention to is, of course, that individual heterogeneity sort of interacts with network heterogeneity, and that's where the action is in some sense. And uh, I, I take your point. In fact, a lot of the interest right now is bringing heterogeneities at the individual level to bear along with network heterogeneities and ask whether they somehow cancel out or do they complement each other. And, and so. I think we're going to have to end with that. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, gobbling up your lunch, and thanks to the panelists. <laughs>